for me, whenever we are trying to make order out of a complex world, storytelling is the, you know, 80,000 year old human invention that helps us navigate those waters. And the job search is just one of them. Your cash flow. Chris, how's it going, sir? Hi, Brian. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Great way to kick it off here. <laughs> well, uh, thanks, thanks for coming. I appreciate you uh, being our first guinea pig here. And uh, I just want to say, you know, this this podcast it's brand new. We're kicking it off now, and the entire success or failure rests square on your shoulders right here. Well, I've had a lot of opportunities to make or break people's lives, careers, and families. And I like to think my batting average is pretty high. So I'll, I'll keep it going. <laughs> love it. Love it. Well, uh, hey, let's let's dive right in here. Uh, you know, the uh, the format of the show, it's, uh, you know, I'm trying to keep it really casual, uh, just like friends getting together, getting drinks like we've done uh, in the past, just, you know, kind of hanging out, talking, sharing business ideas. One of the areas I think uh, we can dive right into that I'm excited to talk with you about here. Uh, Employer brand marketing. I know it's something that you're super, super passionate about and uh, have done a lot of work in. I'd love to just kind of kick today off with that uh, that topic in mind. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think probably storytelling is what I'm passionate about. Its permutations come in lots of forms and employer brand marketing is one of them as my toddler is started crying in the background in case uh, friends at friends at home hear that. Um, the uh, don't worry, it's all part of the, it's all part of the appeal of, of, <laughs> of knowing us as real human um, employer brand. My, my interest in employer brand marketing has been a discovery that we, I feel like we have a, we have a misunderstanding. Um, like last 20 years, we did a lot of conversations around content marketing we've established lots of norms and understand no one thinks that you you launch a product and your sales team is going to have a lot of success without any third party validation validation um information like just 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 buyer journey stuff that content lubricates that that path for some reason on the hiring side we're we're much later to the understanding that if you throw a job description out there and no one has any validation that your company is serious, why do you think that serious professionals with lots of job opportunities would show up? And for me, whenever we are trying to make order out of a complex world, storytelling is the you know, 80,000 year old human invention that helps us navigate those waters. And the job search is just one of them. Yeah, love it. Uh, and actually, you know, I, sh I should have properly introduced you. Uh, hey, so uh, Chris Wink here, CEO of Technically, found, founder and CEO of Technically, uh, local uh, serving, you know, you, you, you can do your, uh, your, your intro here with the kind of whole Northeast sure. tech market here. Uh, uh, briefly, Brian Danis is parole officer, uh, longtime consigliere, <laughs> better known publicly as publisher of tech. Yeah, we're a news organization with a community of technologists and entrepreneurs. Uh, we publish daily in a half dozen US cities. Um, but the readership ends up being a, about 25 cities make up a good bulk of our readership as we do pop up projects across uh, this fair land of ours. Cool. Yeah, I love it. And uh, yeah, employer brand marketing, uh, you know, it's been, uh, it's been an interesting journey for us, because I feel like, you know, marketing is one of the pieces that, uh, you know, we we have a lot of people on our team that that do a lot of marketing and you know sell services that are marketing related to to clients but it's like the shoemakers kids kind of situation where it's often an afterthought for us and uh i feel like recently over the last couple of years we've almost focused more on our story around hiring than we have on sales mm. uh, so it's been like it's it's been an interesting uh journey for us and uh you know, particularly, uh, you know, what, what gets people excited to work at a company. And, and, uh, I think, you know, what you guys are doing is right on the forefront of that, particularly for a lot of the, uh, companies you're working with, a lot of the stories you're telling, whether it be organic, whether it be companies that are 
engaging with technically for specifically employer brand marketing initiatives. Uh, have you seen, uh, you know, any specific trends over the last couple of years that are, you know, notable, interesting to talk about or anything that's been, you know, kind of reinventing the uh, employer brand marketing space, uh, you know, in these, you know, kind of p- pandemic and post pandemic years? Yeah. I, I mean, the societal narrative we're having right now is like remote work, which still makes up a minority of work hours, but its rate of change is what's caught us by surprise. Um, It's still maybe about, about McKinsey says about half of engineering roles may end up being at least partially remote, full on remote companies in what we consider tech or tech relevant tech adjacent companies could be as many quarter as a quarter of them could be fully remote, which are all big numbers because there's tripling or quadruplings of numbers in, in three years. That's, that's truly transformative in terms of change, but it's not most. That's like the critical point that I think we often forget rate of change and, and like raw number, two different things. Wait, go, go back on that for a second. So you said yeah. uh, you, you're saying it's not most teams are remote or not most companies are remote. Yeah. Just like raw numbers. It's not, most is that just by headcount or what uh what, what's the data on that specifically it, it depends on which data set so like mckenzie has has a data set that's typically used they use um hours and a, about half of engineering roles which is by and away the um the leading occupation for remote work for obvious reasons that we may even get into but um uh, McKinsey's numbers use, which perhaps you can drop in the show notes, uh, and, and I can I can share their stuff that I saw in the last eighteen months. Um, that even McKinsey's numbers, like that, it's the it's the it's the occupation, engine, you know, software and software adjacent engineering roles. It's only about half, which is still stunning because it's a big dramatic change. But I think it was like fifty two percent of engineering hours will be done remotely, which is made up primarily of full-time remote employees, hmm. not entirely, but majority. Maybe it's just the world that I'm in, but I feel like most of the companies, if not pretty much all of the companies I'm talking to are remote teams. And, it, and maybe it's just the sample that I'm dealing with, but- I'm, uh, I'm here to tell you that it is the sample, Brian. I'm here with the data and I can tell you that it's just your sample. <laughs> yeah, and that's, I think that's the point. That it's, it, there's real ranges in <clears throat> in bubbles. So it depends on who we're talking about. Yes, you are, if you're, if you're, SaaS or software adjacent, um, and you have a lot of engineering roles, um, and you have a kind of commitment to culture. Yeah, you you are probably you've probably shifted. You you all have shifted the amount remote. Many have gone fully remote, and maybe those numbers will keep surging. There have been lots of numbers, which we can talk and talk about that I've spent 15 years following that have all changed in the last two years. So, you know, to loop us all the way back to the question you asked me, you know, two minutes ago, all sorts of things that I've followed for a decade have changed more in the last 18 months than they did in the first almost 15 years. I followed a lot of this stuff. So yeah, all well. sorts of stuff has just been thrown up in the air that I knew to be consistent truths, but were really just post great recession, slow, steady economic growth, macroeconomic, low interest rate trends. Those are really just the environment that, that you and I really came up in. And that's just a, a, an era, you know, there were, there was a bell bottom era and we got a low interest rate, slow and steady growth era and the bell bottom era is over, over. So when you ask me about trends that have shifted, yeah, a ton. Um, Everyone is trying to find how do you tell a story that remote work is good for you? Because if you're fully remote, you, as you know well, are also then in a very big ocean. And suddenly you are competing also against any other firm in the world. You, you lose all commute advantage, which was also, I think I saw those numbers, was, was put it like almost a quarter of people's job decisions was tied to commute. So you could in some sense say, that if you go fully remote, you lose what was once a classic strategic advantage for a century of professional work. Um, so that's a major, in a sense, in employer brand 
marketing narrative because folks have to go back to, all right, but really why do people work here? Uh, and if you're in the most hiring, if you're in the most competitive hiring environment, Money gets tricky. There's great research, the positive psychology stuff, Martin Ziegelman, you know, University of Pennsylvania, and then other folks followed on around income earning. Once you get beyond 100K, 125K, you start getting diminishing returns in terms of happiness for every dollar you earn. So there are limits to how much money can can. Yeah, buy I've happens. heard before like studies, I don't know who does the studies, but it's like you give a... Uh, a raise like a major raise and it's you know like three months or something that that you know impacts you know measurable performance or so uh it's it's interesting what what other uh you mentioned there's a bunch of things that have changed that you've seen you know things you've been following for a decade or so that have you know kind of just all all of a sudden uh you know completely flipped on its head is there other uh you know interesting examples that you, that you have in your back pocket well, it's half a step away from your earlier question, but but one of the biggest shakeups in my land of coverage on economic change, business reporting, how companies grow and exist, um, is is business and corporations. So what we we call entrepreneurship, um, we were in a forty year serialized decline in rates of entrepreneurship, despite all the narrative of entrepreneurship you know, Shark Tank on TV or whatever. Um, uh, millennials were on track to be the least entrepreneurial generation in American history. We were starting fewer and fewer businesses. And wow, is of- that really true? Over the last yeah. 10 years, it's been declining that rapidly? Oh, farther, Brian. It's been declining since the 70s. Wow, um, interesting. And some of that, there's a, lots of big macroeconomic factors in that. It is it is consolidated consolidation of big industries, um, um, it is, um, I mean, like franchise models, cause some of them are, are traditionally not seen as, or not, do not count in business, in, in a business corporation. Some of them do, I should clarify, but, um, people often point to, uh, excessive health insurance costs, uh, in the United States. Mm-hmm. And, um, cause there are, there is some, uh, research that I've seen that you can find patterns in. Uh, costlier health insurance markets, healthcare markets, folks typically when health insurance is tied to an employer like it is in the United States, which is not obviously in, in lots of places, um, folks then stay stuck and stuck in employment. So there's lots of big reasons, but for you know the entirety of technically history, we kept reporting on efforts to grow entrepreneurship hubs, efforts to celebrate entrepreneurship, but we always had to caveat our informed reporting with people are trying to grow entrepreneurship, but it ain't working. So that and, that's my question. So is it like startup culture? I feel like is so it's like, it's a, it's a big thing now, you know, it's, it feels like a big thing. And there's so many people that want to build startups that are trying to build startups, you know, obviously a small percentage succeed, uh, you know, whatever the definition of success is, but, uh, you know, a small percentage succeed, uh, you know, let's say that's, you know, getting to uh, $100,000 or $200,000, whatever in in revenue uh, per year, maybe that's, you know, kind of like the benchmark for success or fail. But uh, it's interesting, you know, I can't claim to be around in the 70s to, uh, you know, to to talk about what it was like, but it feels to me like the startup culture is bigger than it's ever been. Uh, That's really interesting data that you've, uh, you know, just kind of talked about there. Well, it all changed. So the point is, during this pandemic, it's all shifted. Um, so now we've had higher rates of business incorporation, business creation, than we have uh, since the 80s, at least. Um, and I have had many a conversation with an economist that spends a lot of time trying to understand what's going on. Um, failure rates have also been somewhat high, so there's some degree of churn. Um, some of it is in the hospitality and tourism that had had a like real excessive churn in business incorporation. But there's a category called high propensity businesses that the census tracks and Bureau of Labor Statistics. And it includes, it does include restaurants because it's a high propensity just means a high likelihood of hiring employees and, and restaurants are likely to, to hire employees. Um, but it does include tech and tech enabled firms. They do show up there. Um, e-commerce does show up there. Um, and it's boomed. So that's a, major change and rates of incorporation 
from black, Hispanic and women founders all have outpaced white male founders for much of the last pandemic years. And it also just had never happened before. Um, and similarly, for years, for 10 years, I wrote, you know, probably a story every 18 months that had some, you know, some version of the same hook that was everyone's working on these startup clusters. Everyone's talking about needing more wealth distributed across entrepreneurship, but it ain't working. It ain't working. It ain't working. It ain't working. And then the last two years have been me interviewing people I'm like, what's happening? I don't know. Everything that we knew for 30 years has been different right now. Wow. Interesting. And is it just the pandemic or is something longer lasting happening? Maybe that so, uh, we had sort of entrepreneurship efforts. Maybe that worked. You, you've probably heard this before, like uh, the concept of, uh, you know, how startups are, you know, there's, you know, like wines or vintages of wines. There's like yeah. certain years where the weather was great, you know, whatever the, uh, there wasn't too much sun and the grapes got just the right amount of whatever. And those years, those vintages of, of wines are like the best wines, you know, whatever. I'm not a, a sommelier or whatever you call it, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, the same thing with startups. And if you look back at some of the most epic startups that turned into, you know, the massive tech companies that we have today, uh, a lot of them came out of like that 2001 to 2004 era. And then, you know, then the next batch was like the 2008 to 2012 era where, uh, you know, kind of like economically we were at the lowest point. And, uh, you know, the kind of the I think the general uh, uh, talk around that idea is that, you know, you have uh, you have to really, you know, there's not like funny money floating around, you know, we're not you know, Facebook for dogs isn't getting funded during those, those years. And, uh, you know, you have to really have a true, uh, you know, solid business pitch to get funded. And then on top of that, the market is less likely to, uh, expend funds, you know, buy products or services that are, uh, that are not, you know, truly valuable. So you have to really get your product market fit. Plus I think during those downturns, you can get, you know, probably lower cost talent into your organization. So, uh, you know, it's not like what we've seen over the last two years where, uh, you know, the cost of talent has gone up considerably. It's, uh, you know, it's a different set of market conditions that somehow, you know, kind of mint these, uh, these sort of like vintages of startups. Uh, what do you think? Do you think we're headed into another round of that here? Well, there's two parts to that. I mean, to our theme on storytelling, some of that is storytelling that we have, um, you know, the, 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 it's, it's Ford got started in a recession. And, and then we talk about Airbnb and we, those bookend the two there, you know, they're, they're like, they bookend a century of entrepreneurship. Um, when you look at the business and corporation data, it isn't what happens that in recessions, we all stop starting companies, which is why these last two years have been wild. Um, Business, rates of business and corporation happen during economic growth periods. They don't happen in during downturns. Now, you might say in a story we tell is maybe you're tinkering with an idea. We like the idea of, I mean, full disclosure, I was an underemployed person in the Great Recession who started a company that you know employs a few dozen people and has over the course of 15 years. So, so I can fit into that narrative. Um, so I know it as a, as a, as a, Journalist and someone who does spends a lot of work thinking about storytelling, I'm aware of how incredibly powerful storytelling is, both for us to understand a complex world and to oversimplify narratives. So one, yes, I think it is true, and I completely agree that it's a great and important thing to say to someone, uh, you get knocked on your butt, it's a great time to say, all right, what is what does the next wave mean? That's all true. I am optimistic about the resiliency of what entrepreneurship can mean to us. And as someone who has spent a lot of his professional life investing in the idea of local entrepreneurship communities, because I have seen and do believe density and proximity and the tribalism of local can accelerate people into doing great things. Um, and I don't think the pandemic will negate that it'll change it but it won't negate it um so i believe cities and places and entrepreneurs have an incredible opportunity in this moment to consider what 
happens next. My caution is just, there are enormous macroeconomic factors that work around us that we sometimes, it's the dark matter of what we can and can't do. (laughs) And I think it's worth noting that there is more luck in what we do than we often like to admit. I love that dark matter uh, yeah. concept, uh, but you know, it, so devil's advocate. I, I've yeah. heard uh, you know entrepreneurs create their own luck. They uh, they they find opportunities. You know they they you know they they identify luck when it happens and strike when the iron's hot. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, I, I I think there is just like some kind of universe dice roll that just happens for us all and in, in you know in business and in life so i i, yes. I can relate to the idea my, i mean my i 15 years in reporting a lot of founders i have a rule of thumb that i give people who quote unquote succeeded less credit than most and i give people who quote unquote failed more credit than they get uh, and i think that's that's often my over correction there's also the old line that um anyone who tells you you should pursue your passion, do what you love, and it'll work out as someone who's already rich. So I also do think that there's a lot of risk-taking behavior that is a lot easier when the deck is already stacked in our favor. Um, I've had lots of those conversations with entrepreneurs, and, and you know that I know there's an incredibly brilliant and almost like maniacal focus that I've found in the most impressive founders I've ever spoken to. Like I, they're, they're, they're like psychotic focus on a problem they want to solve is something that is undeniable. And that would be a version of make your own luck. Yes. I think that's true. I do. I do believe that, that there is something that is always spellbinding to me when I've met those people. Um, so I, I got a story to share, and I, w- I want to see if you have one similar yeah, too, because you, you've, you've probably met a lot more entrepreneurs than me. Oh. Uh, so uh, this is a so preface. The story is about somebody who has achieved pretty impressive success in business, yeah. but uh, just totally blows my mind how this person is able to accomplish anything in life. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, are you talking about me? Oh man, how'd you get me? <laughs> So I worked for this company, uh, 2020 Communications down in Florida, uh, Mm. literally selling, you know, like, uh, you know, it was was even a contractor. It was like 1099. This is back, literally, this is back in 2007, 2006, Mm. 2007, uh, selling like uh, Fios and, uh, you know, internet services to small businesses and, you know, some residential. Uh, And I, you know, I did that for maybe like six months or something. And, uh, Go so they they had this conference where they brought out the CEO of the company. So it's a sizable company. I don't, I don't know where they're at today, but they were in the thousands of employees back then. So mm. if you do the math, I'd had to I'd have to guess they're probably eight figures, if not you know, well into the nine figures of revenue. Uh, CEO comes out at the conference. We're at like a Ritz Carlton or something with you know maybe two hundred sales reps in in mm. Tampa. Guy comes on stage uh, wearing like you know, ripped up jeans, you know, like a stained t-shirt and a blazer (laughs) that was like all wrinkled and stuff, like all scruffy. And he just starts winging self-help books out into the audience. And uh, we're all at like these tables, uh, you know, we have glasses, you know, water and, you know, drinks and stuff. And like books are like hitting glasses and like shattering, like glasses flying all over the room, like broken shards of glass. And like people are getting drenched in like, you know, diet Coke and water. And everyone's like in shock, like, oh my God, I don't want to get hit in the head with a book and get a concussion. And uh, then the guy starts talking and he's like, he's like, I spend a hundred thousand dollars a month on my landscape at my house. And you can too, if you just sell harder. Oh, geez. <laughs> and Inspiring I was like, Inspiring stuff. And that was literally the moment where I was like, all right, if this guy is able to build this business, you know, I was probably, you know, when I'm, I was maybe like 20, 21 years old or something, 20, 21 years old mm-hmm. at that time. And I'm like, man, if this guy built this company to this size and this is who he is, then, you know, what's, what's stopping me from doing it? It's so. inspiring. It is inspiring. <laughs> he literally inspired me. <laughs> See, I mean, I, I've always thought that there are like, and there, I, I think I've read 
uh, some research that backs up a version of this, though this is also a simplified narrative of it. But that there's like there's three inputs to almost any creative endeavor, and entrepreneurship is obviously a creative endeavor. Um, it it absolutely takes pure skill. Like you, I will never discount that. What percentage any given skill, and what you're skilled at can be very different things, right? Like you can be skilled at bringing people together, noting a market opportunity you know, having just pure technical skill, you could just be incredibly savvy and just, you know, those are all things. You got to have some skill in some version. You got to work hard. We know that in some form and there's got to be luck. And everyone's story is like, I think some variation of those three, they all, they all play. And I'm, I'm sure there are entrepreneurs who are heavier on the skill or heavier on the hard work and a little bit lesser in the luck, but all three skill, hard work and luck play in in and there are people who won't make it who worked as hard and were really skilled but never got any luck or there are people who you know perhaps that those were referencing who maybe have less skill and got a crap load of luck but we're willing to work hard or whatever so i always picture whenever I'm, I'm interviewing or profiling or talking to a founder i always picture there's some those three dials are in some position at any given time and i think a lot of business strategy ignores at least one of them um and i think well let's uh let's look let's unpack that though because there's different uh in my opinion uh there's different levels of you know companies you know there's different levels of luck required depending on what you're building so let's say like uh you know, a company like, uh, you know, a real estate brokerage office, you know, you go and you get your paperwork done and that's kind of just like a grind, right? You just go out and network and do the BNI stuff and, you know, kind of build it up grassroots, just, you know, build your, build your portfolio, then start hiring realtors under you and then build them up. And it's just kind of like, you know, that's more of like a slog type business where it's relatively, you know, luck is less important in the equation. But what, Brian, you sound crazy to me. If you started that in, if you started your real estate brokerage in 2006 or 2008. Yeah, here versus you. 2010 versus 2020. Just by virtue of what year you were born or when you got into, that is wild. That's almost, that, that strikes me as like an especially luck-filled one because of the macroeconomic factors that have to do with it. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I hear your point on that. I, I'm uh you know, I'm taking your, uh, your counterpoint, but then <laughs> let's, let's look at, let's look at the opposite end of the spectrum. Okay. So let's look at like, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of a good idea. So a company like, uh, suspenders you know, for dogs. <laughs> no, no, not a good idea. All that's right. a bad, that's a bad one because I literally right. just bought, uh, a, a turtleneck sweater and, uh, a, uh, a little bat wings for my cats on you know. Amazon. So you whoever's, Whoever's got that market market cornered, man, they uh, you know they they read me like a book there. This portion of cash flow is brought to you by costumes for pets. <laughs> costumes for pets, your Amazon shipper of choice. Back to you, Brian. There you go. There you go. All right. So, uh, but you know, let's look at like a business that was like a, a category creating business. Uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of a good one. Maybe you know, like there's some obvious ones like uh, Salesforce or something. Uh, but even if you go all the way back, you know, look at like a Microsoft or an Apple, you know, that literally created the category of personal computers, you know, back then, you know, even into the eighties, people were saying that there's never going to be, you know, smart business people. I think even uh, I might be totally misquoting here, but somebody like a Warren Buffett would say things like, oh yeah, you're never going to have computers in the homes of, of people, you know, it's just mm-hmm. not, it's a, it's a business thing, you know, it's uh, it's mainframes. We use it for crunching data back at, you know, HQ, but there's just, there's just never a need. No one needs a computer. Mm-hmm. So what, what do they need a computer for? And uh, you know, businesses like that, that literally created an entire category uh, from scratch. Not only was the, uh, the technical challenge, you know, massively, you know, not insurmountable, but it was next to insurmountable. But, you know, uh, it just, you know, you get what I'm saying? Like, I feel like those types of businesses have just incredible luck factor, luck factor, execution factor. Yeah. Yeah. I, I and again, I just think there are three dials and, you know, they, they will be at any different level. Um, I just think 
it's it requires all three and i've found it i find it galling i think i think there's been a humbling of as, as entrepreneurship has matured i think there's been a reckoning i mean in part because we had a big tech backlash a, a decade or so ago when entrepreneurship was having the beginning of its revival maybe a little farther back but at least then we we looked on societally we looked on at big tech at, at, as marvels they were they were magicians they were wizards they could do no wrong it was it was an emblem of of prestige and there's been some humbling at the big tech level that i think has trickled down i think there is i think i have found on the whole on the whole a humbling of founders too and so i think more do accept the luck story I just think I remember early on in my reporting, bumping into these CEOs who I felt like when I had interviewed them, they were like, I have it all figured out. It just, I was always blown away. You know, when I was a 22 year old reporter, I'm like, I don't know, maybe they're right, but it sounds crazy to me that this dude thinks that he just like has figured out every factor of what's going to go into this industry. Cause like maybe Microsoft, maybe your Calendly and Google's going to just drop a, a Gmail, Gmail feature to schedule calendar uh meetings with like you could just have a massive competitor leap in at the wrong time for your own viability um so calendly is one of those businesses that just blows my mind another one is grammarly mm. uh i forget the revenue but it's like high eight or you know possibly over 100 million uh it, it just like a chrome extension it's it blows my mind you know, obviously there's a lot of engineering that goes into some of the ML and, you know, right. so what they do uh, with processing data and how quickly it's processed, but that's just an epic, you know, Calendly is such a simple concept. Uh, and they're, they're another one that's just like. Uh, I think it's actually well, like Grammarly has made sense to me more because it's something that people are so intimidated by. People are so deeply intimidated. There's such an insecurity around writing that it, it's always felt to me like a, like a solid safety blanket. Um, it, it, it's a security blanket. Uh, Calendly, I guess, it, you know, it, it just, it was like, you know, it was like doodle for a while. There were things that just were solving this very specific pain point that lots of people do have um, and how you execute it. So those I think still amount to, of course, there's technical skill and acumen and marketing skill and like all those things that I am in awe of. And with all my reporting and running a small company, I'm constantly exposed to the awe I have for a, again, a maniacal focus on growth, which I think has lots of societal negatives, but I think it also has done incredible good. It's a very complex story, which is why I'm still reporting on it in some sense uh, 15 years later. Yeah, it's it's pretty wild. It's like how how did the Beatles end up becoming the Beatles versus some other four mm. schmucks that were playing pubs in London at the same time? It's uh, it's interesting uh, how how these things happen sometimes. Yeah, you you in some sense fill a market niche, and it's the right ingredients, which is which is never to take away, as I'm sure you're implying. You don't say you know they're clearly not talentless, but we have to accept that all of culture. We all play a little bit of right, you know, right time, right place. Um, and we all get versions of it. It just depends on which lottery ticket you pulled sometimes. Yeah, sure. So uh, changing gears here. Uh, I, let me know if you can talk about it or not. The uh, the thing <laughs> we were talking about last time uh, when we were uh, getting drinks in Fishtown. Uh, your, the fun new, your, uh, your, your fungus problem. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. Yeah, it's still it's actually gotten worse. It's spreading. <laughs> it's uh it's you know, it's taking over. <laughs> I I have not book project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um I I mean I I I I have not uh I've not sold the book. So I guess I can't I mean, but I, the concept is something that I've written about and spoken about before. So certainly the concept is something that is entirely appropriate to talk cool. about. Cool. Yeah, talk about that. I I think it was really interesting what you were telling me. So definitely hey, uh thanks. talk about that. Uh so something that I have spoken and in, in written ab about is something that I'm coming to call journalism thinking, the idea that increasingly journalistic-like skill 
is showing up way outside news organizations and the web is powering it. So what are some examples? Three big categories that I keep bumping into. Um, a class of content marketers that are increasingly trying to take their work to newer heights. They're doing great data research. I talked to the head of, um, uh, a longtime head of content at Hilton, who talked about the the fact checking process that went into a documentary series they did on the impacts climate change has on travel destinations. Um, they were doing rigorous fact checking. Um, creators that are trying to differentiate themselves. I interviewed um, a a a finance TikToker with a couple hundred thousand um, followers who is putting real effort in understanding complex issues, knowing the historical context it sits in, drawing charts and graphs and doing illustrations to explain the news trends and how people to understand it. Um, and nonprofits and advocacy groups that are increasingly doing their own data work to try to defend their mission. Um, all of these groups, the creators, the marketers, the, the advocates, in my mind, are doing it because 20 years into robust web publishing, everyone's trying to differentiate themselves. And I think there's a always a demand for quality. Um, so the quality keeps going up. And there are things that over 500 years, journalism figured out that I keep finding people who don't know about journalism are recreating without realizing some of those solutions have already been found. So I'm interested in trying to talk about journalism thinking as a, as a package of best practices people could could put in to, to grow their organizational goals, to grow communities of trust, you might say. One of the interesting examples of that, when you shared me that, uh, you know, what you're working on there, it was the uh, first thing that popped in my head was uh, that kid on Twitter who tracks where Elon Musk's jet is. There you go. And yep. uh, literally just tweets the location of Elon Musk's jet. He just, you know, somehow, like, I guess it's public record with, FAA or whatever, and just tweets out the location of it. And, yep. uh, you know, it's, and it, he's blowing up. Like he has, I don't, I don't know how many followers on Twitter, but it's, you know, it's a not sneezable number. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, hilarious that, you know, that that's what blew up, you know, people are trying to, and it makes sense why it's so simple, but, you know, so many people are trying to build followings and, you know, get their Twitter follows up and their YouTube follows and some kid, you know, I don't know, 16 year old kid or whatever comes along and just posts where Musk's jet is today. And that's, you know, that that's just taken off. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> right. And I mean, I, I, I have an uncomfortable relationship with these platforms. They are transformative. No one can say otherwise. And the opportunity they represent is remarkable um, we like the idea of it celebrating merit and merit alone, you know, great idea ideas rise to the, to the top. We, we, we also yearn for that to be the case. And I think a lot of ways it's true, right? Like I, I'm, I, I used to think I was funny until I spent enough time on Twitter and saw how much funnier people are, which is like an incredible, you know, people's best, sharpest writing. The, the only joy I get at Twitter is, is I still consume it to find just like goofy jokes and lines that people do incredibly cleverly. Um, but also uh, the serious work that I'm finding on platforms, you know, that, that are showing up in TikTok. Um, humans capacity for ingenuity is limitless. Uh, I think we need more boundaries at times because I think we are not yet comprehending how much power we have now. And for all of journalism's faults, and there are a lot, and all of what news organizations have done wrong, and there is a lot, <laughs> um, over centuries, we did figure out some stuff and there are some best practices and there are some boundaries. Um, we can't hold everyone back, but it's helpful. And we, as journalists, notoriously didn't talk to our readers about the processes we had. 
Um, the famously uh, news organizations have struggled about never having editor bylines, meaning, you know, we at technically every single story is read by at least one person fact checked and, 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 and copy edited that person's name doesn't exist anywhere in the article. So of course our readers don't know or think about it. They see reporters byline. That's what they know. There's a whole bunch of like cultural and structural reasons to why that's the case, but we didn't demonstrate to the world that over centuries, we found it pretty important to just have a second set of eyes. And we are like entering an era where, where truly anyone can have, tens of millions of people bigger than than like any publication in the mid 20th century ever had and you can have that on a whim that's that is incredible i think we need to talk about some agreed upon best practices. <laughs> so tell me about that you know i i i agree with a lot of what you're saying here it makes uh makes sense to me, you know, having more of a, you know, what you just described in software development, that's like a pull request, you know, you, you have a junior or mid-level developers that write code and then they, you know, they want to push it up, but you don't just let them push it right into the production branch. You have to, you know, do a pull request to a team lead or an architect, and then they review your code and decide if it gets merged into the master branch and then hand, they handle that process. So it's kind of like a similar concept as what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, what would, you know, in, in like a utopia, what would, what would the process for, uh, you know, influencers who are, uh, and have you thought about this? Like, in, like what's the kind of like best practices or, uh, you know, framework around how solo influencers uh, deal with just, you know, before they hit tweet? Well, I want to clarify and say that I, I don't think everyone I don't in any sense think everyone's going to follow uh, journalism thinking. Um, I think some who want to differentiate themselves, there's a playbook to follow. And, and that's probably a distinction worth making. Um, like the, 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 the horse doesn't go back in the barn. Like I, I think we're in an era in which um, I can make a crude joke about you tonight on social and there's not really a lot you can do about it. Um, we police that culturally. There, there are no real laws that I wrote a piece a couple of weeks ago that I, I've just been interested in on, um, on, um, in, in most common law around copyright in, in, in most countries, United States, UK, other who have shaped a lot of international law. Um, you can't, you can't copyright a fact. You can't copyright an idea. And so lots of trades that traffic in ideas, journalism, stand up comedy, a lot of academic research, um, they are the industries that have a lot of culture around calling people a plagiarist. Like it really cuts to call a journalist a, a plagiarist is a deep wound. Famously, journalists who have been caught in that way don't come back. Comedians, famously, like that is like those are like that's the scarlet letter. You call a comedian a you know ripping off people's jokes. That is that is a damning sentence. Why is it so culturally significant? Because there's not really any legal precedent. That's the only way we police it just by, by, by building culture around it. Um, we're so new in the social, on the social platforms. We don't have any of that culture. What's if I, if you do a dance and I copy that dance, am I honoring you? Am I ripping you off? Um, just last year, TikTok introduces the ability to, to tag a video that I was inspired by in part because creators were yelling at them that, that like, we feel like people are just being ripped, ripped off. Um, we are shaping right now the culture of what is okay to do in the in the transfer of ideas on these massive platforms that can go global in minutes and that's not gonna go backward i'm that's there's we've never gone backward in the history of humanity we have never gone backward in the amount and access of information uh, there's some caveats but I'll, I'll go with it um so i don't think it goes back but I do think we can fight for culture because that's what culture is. We create culture all the time. We, we start deciding what are standards. Why is it okay for me to copy your dance on TikTok, but not okay for me to kind of rip, rip, rip off your joke from one stand-up routine to the next? Culture. That's the only answer. We have culture and kind of like, you know it. You know it as uh, Brian Danis. You know the, that you would kind of say, oh, if I told you this comedian ripped me off and I was a stand-up guy, you would get it. That's, oh, that's skeevy. That's bad. 
it's a creation of culture. Uh, and we need to do the same thing on social platforms and, and, and the web. And I think entrepreneurs otherwise, uh, entrepreneurs or other people who live on the internet should care about that. We have stakeholdership in that for sure. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Uh, short, short side tangent to that, but uh, a, a friend of mine, he's uh, a little bit of a nerd. He told me about uh, this concept. Are you talking of... about me again? How did, man, you keep, you keep picking this out. I'm trying to like slip it in there. Got you it. Know. Uh, so he, he talks about this, this concept of, uh, you know, in Star Trek where uh, there's, you know, in the future you have materializers. So everything just gets materialized out of, you know, thin air. Mm. And uh, so like currency is kind of, you know, unimportant anymore. You don't really need to trade dollars for anything because you can just materialize anything you want. So the new currency, like the more important form of currency then is your like respect or, or your credibility mm. or, you know, your, uh, your honor as a person. And, uh, it's, you know, it's totally kind of ridiculous, unapplicable to, uh, to, I guess it is applicable, but it's, uh, you know, kind of just a random, uh, tangent that made me think of what you're talking about here. This kind of like unspoken, uh, you know, r- rule of honor. I mean, in some sense, it's 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 one of the oldest concepts we've had, right? Like when you think about why is the human species so <clears throat> successful in so far of there being billions and billions of us, um, it's the ability we have to organize complex societies, which really do, in some form or another, come back a lot to. Integrity, we, we hope, or at least we like to think, right? Like, I think we all would say we want our society to honor integrity more than most. Now, that's taken advantage of, right? We have a lot of classist concepts because we, we mistakenly think money flows to honor, you know, lots. We, we of course, know that that's not true, Um Small side note from research that I've been fascinated by for years. Uh, two brothers in the United States in the 21st century are more likely to earn the same than they are to be the same height. Hmm. The capture of where we are going to stay socioeconomically is more indicative than physical attributes. And that can circle back to earlier point around the luck that I think we sometimes ignore, uh, like the unspoken systems that bind us to our destinies. That's sort of what I think about a lot. So like macro scale, you know, time, you know, millennia, uh, where do you, where do you think Western civilization is right now? I, I've been thinking about this uh, and, and, and chatting, chatting with people like every empire has like its rise and its fall. Sure. Uh, where, where do you think we are? Uh, and I'm asking you because you're a really philosophical guy and I, I always <laughs> get just like awesome nuggets of just crazy, but just really provocative stuff when I talk with you. So where, where do you think we are as a Western civilization and society, or maybe just a global society as a whole on that kind of like cycle of empires and, you know, uh, economies and whatever. Yeah. Um, Crazy but provocative is is going to be on my gravestone. I hope. Um, <laughs> I uh, so so perhaps in, in part. I, I don't I don't know, but maybe it sounds like maybe it's a book you read, but like uh, hedge fund celebrity Ray Dalio has his book series Principles, um, and he had one I think two years ago. I think Rise and Fall of Empires. Uh, Forgive me, Ray, if you're listening. Forgive me if you're getting your title wrong, but I think it's I think it's you're the second person. I haven't read uh Ray Dalio, but you're the second person uh this week who's recommended him to me. Well, be careful. I didn't recommend. I said I'm I'm referencing the book. I thought maybe what you were saying sounded like perhaps you have. Um, but so so the the it it's certainly a provocative book. Um and he has access to lots of smart people. Um so is this principal series and and the book from the last couple of years was like basically arguing that there are these big macroeconomic cycles that take place over hundreds of years. And we're kind of foolish to only be focusing on these, these little 20 or 30 year intervals that he argues that 
you can look over 500 year empire histories. Um, and he, you know, he's simply in the simplest form arguing the United States is in a, a very orderly and very normal decline. And surprise, surprise, China's on a very normal, normal rise. Now, I, I, in the very glowing coverage of him, I find I've been very off put by the fact that um, Erdelio has billions of dollars under management in China, a country that famously is led by a communist party that is not particularly interested in people criticizing it. So Ray Dalio, for all of its incredibly important, interesting insights, is not an objective voice in this matter. To our earlier point of journalism thinking, Ray Dalio is, has an incredibly large financial incentive to complement the rise of China and has no, risks nothing to criticize the United States, which I think is in one sense incredible, a, a really remarkable thing about our country that he will suffer no consequences for being critical and pointing to an American decline. Uh, but he, he cannot say publicly in any meaningful way that China's in decline. In fact, he got in a little bit of trouble because he glancingly, half-heartedly referenced that there are some issues within China. And he walked that back because it was such enormous business um, concepts. So my point is, I, I don't think It does seem both cliche and obvious that we're going to enter in a real rough Cold War period here. Uh, and there's going to be very different systems developing in the, you know, broad, uh, you know, trying on the safe phrase, but, but like United States and allies and a, a Chinese and allies. And it'll be really interesting to see how that navigates. It seems like it's very high stakes uh, because I think that. I am worried about a society in which we put security over liberty, which I, is a cultural choice. It is. What do you What do you mean by put security over liberty? I'm, I mean, the, the Chinese Communist Party offers an incredibly interesting alternative to the American system. They have a very for for you know. 30 years, an incredible story of we will have more control as a state and a single party, and we will give you security, but you will have no independence, right? Like there's not a free open internet. You can't research and look into criticism of your government. That obviously deeply worries me as a journalist. I do believe the, 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 the Churchill line that democracy is the worst system except for all the others. And I think that we're going to have a really big battle over the next 50 years around those cultural norms. Um, I believe the Chinese Communist Party and, and China is representing obviously one of the most incredible, dynamic, interesting countries in human history, uh, one of the most important societies. Um, I think competition is good to loop back to our entrepreneurship story. So I believe there's a way in which it can be good for these two systems to be really challenged. An authoritarian one that says we'll get shit done faster and we will keep you safer, they would say. Um, and you give up a lot of control and an American system that will look dysfunctional, but will look dysfunctional because we can talk openly. Uh, I, 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 it's been a couple of weeks, not a real long time, but a couple of weeks in, 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 you know, three large Chinese cities in, in like 2006, 2007, 2008, 2007, 2008. Um, not a lot of time. Um, but I remember really being shocked despite what I knew, just still how like, right. You can't go out in the street and say, you know, Let's go, Brandon. Um, you, you, that's galling, obviously, to my incredibly privileged cultural boundary that I have, that I believe our system is important. And I think it's net good for society. Obviously, I'm biased. Obviously, I'm representing an interest. Um, but that is, that is a belief that I hold. 
So when you ask your question of where are we, um, yeah, man, I think I think 50 years from now, folks will be talking about beginning, you know, I think I probably World Trade Organization entry for China in 2001 will probably be that real life marking point. I think 2001 will, will say like was the real beginning of this new Cold War era and what that means for the American regime, the American empire, uh, whether we get second life or not. Because remember, like the fall of Rome, you know, that's 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 a centuries long story, right? Like it's not, it doesn't doesn't happen over 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 decades. Yeah, we just we remember it like, oh, Rome fell, it was over. <laughs> right. But centuries. So yeah, I, I think we're entering in like I think our great grandchildren will be thinking about it will be a story of the American and, and Chinese. I was in Rome last year and they, uh, I was, I had a, hired a history tour guide to take me around and he, and, you know, I was asking like, so what happened to the Coliseum? Like, why is it all torn apart? Like, did it just disintegrate? He's like, no. And, uh, you know, I forget what the years were, but whatever, you know, hundreds or thousands of years ago, or, you know, a thousand years, 500 years ago, whatever it was, uh, Rome was in like the worst economically after the collapse of the Roman empire. But a lot of like, it was at the low, but a lot of rich people started moving into Rome and building mansions. Uh, but they uh, they didn't want to buy materials, so they just went and took blocks of marble from the Colosseum. They said, "Oh, here's my uh, staircase leading into my house, and this is going to be in my kitchen." And they just br- ripped the pieces right out and built their house with it. Yep. Yeah, I mean, we 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 again. I mean, to bring us back here all the way to the beginning around storytelling. Um, it's, it is our human survival tactic. Um, and so one story we tell is that there are these very neat packaged beginning, middle, and end. Fairy tales are really good for my kid, my toddler. Um, and they're very helpful for us. They're, our brains are incredible how much we can remember and how much we can put together. We can mix and match, but we ha- can only do it by, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll, but by simplifying the story, um, the, the comparison that I think about a lot that that many folks have have referenced before me um, is you know we're compressing files. That's what that's what memory and stories are. Um, we can only fit so much on our storage, you know, and we only have so much storage capacity. So that's why memory is incredibly faulty. That's why our stories are incredibly simplified because that's like how we keep the pieces together. Um, and then you have to like revisit and go back and, and, and get the complex narrative to it. But so like, yeah, the, the, the fall of these societies, we picture it being like, what did that take like an afternoon? Uh, and like, well, it was like, that was like centuries of erosion and change and morphing. And, and, and it's really hard. We just look to historians that kind of, you know, you want in Wikipedia a neat end. Like when was the enlightenment? Well, people could say it's any di- where it started anywhere between like like two hundred year difference in when it began, depending on what you call the beginning. Is it like Newtonian physics, or is it, um, you know, is it is it like like the, just what do you call the beginning? Um, and we're always conjuring story in how we navigate our businesses, uh, how we navigate life, and that's an incredible tool. It's also our biggest weakness. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Uh, th- this was awesome, man. I, I think we're at like a good, uh, a good wrapping up Thanks. point here, but uh, we talked about almost nothing that had to do with technology. Maybe it was like 5% technology, but at the same time, almost everything, you know, like this, this show I'm, I'm gearing it for, uh, you know, entrepreneurs. I'm, you know, there's a lot of early stage entrepreneurs podcasts out there. So I'm looking to kind of gear this towards more like the mid uh, you know, to kind of like mature startup or, you know, uh, maybe companies that are past the startup phase and scaling. And, uh, you know, there's like a lot of just life lessons, you know, just concepts in general that apply to, you know, just all aspects of life, whether it's building a business, whether it's, you know, personal improvement. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff that we covered here, ideas, philosophies, et cetera, that, uh, just, uh, it's always, you know, what I'm, what I'm trying to say here is it's always a pleasure talking to you, man. I always get, I always, uh, you know, get a couple good nuggets here and there. Brian, they call me McDonald's for dishing out those nuggets. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I do want to, before we close, I, w- I want to say uh, to the listeners that uh, I texted Chris to invite Chris to the show 
uh, to do this first episode with me. And uh, I, I texted him. He's like, hell yes, immediately. And then I'm like, do you want a pregame uh, before we jump on? He goes, uh, what do you mean? Like take shots? <laughs> what, I mean, what do I, you know, I'm just learning Brian's interview style. What do I know? <laughs> Brian wants to keep us loose. For the record, I had uh, a little tea and some seltzer to keep me lubricated this conversation. <laughs> Brian. So no, no shots. <laughs> And I, 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 oh, I guzzled that seltzer somewhat, somewhat rapidly. They, um, <laughs> it is a pleasure. It's, it's business building is a long journey. And you hit on it earlier that, uh, the story, the story we want at the end is what we have to stay focused on. And not everyone's story is the same. And we get really trapped into thinking we're all supposed to be following the same story of like, you know, the exit or the IPO or the whatever, um, I, I remember a, an interview I did many years ago um, of this older kind of like repeat founder who's investing. And he said to me that, let's see if I can do this right. He said something like, um, I'll get it wrong, but like, you know, every, every, whatever, every 30 year old wants to have a thousand employees. Every 40 year old wants to have a hundred employees. Every 50 year old wants to have 10 employees. Every 60 year old wants to be a one person consultant. And I, I I think whether that's true or not, at least always pictured that at different stages of our life, we also want different things too. And, and that has to be okay. I'm having that exact same, uh, you know, thought process myself. So totally get that. But uh, dude, it's a pleasure. I love, uh, love connecting with you. This has uh, been awesome. Looking forward to pushing this thing live and uh, I'll see you soon. See you soon, Brian. Thanks so much.